Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon. It is September 4th. We are picking up in Bereshit in Genesis chapter 50. Ah, bittersweet because we're going to come to the end of our beloved study that's been close to three years. <laughs> but that's what I call a good study. <laughs> we said all along we weren't here to be in a hurry, but we dealt with the loss of uh, Yaakov. Uh, at the very end and really there's no reason to review we can come right in and start with verse 1 and see the love that the son had for his father then Yosef fell on his father's face and he wept he wept over him and he kissed him and this again it's just showing his great love he sobbed at the, the death of the we'll call it home going but he went into um, Sha'ol, into the heart of the earth, into Avraham's bosom. We talked about that last week. Yosef knows he will see him again, and that's the beautiful thing about it. But the same way that Yosef had a love for his earthly father, Yaakov, Jacob, we see again a final picture, I think I can say, because we're right here at the end for Yosef also, of how he's an example of the Messiah. And we see the love that the Son of God had for his father, who said, I've come to do the will of my father, that he came in that capacity, that love that is so great. So sadly, we see that Yaakov's life, earthly life has ended, and Yosef commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. They had to embalm him because it was going to be a long journey to take him back to Hebron to the cave of Machpelah where he's going to be buried. It's not something that could be done quickly. He couldn't jump in an airplane. You know, he couldn't get a taxi. <laughs> you have to remember the times that we were in. It would take time and the, the preservation of the body needed to take place for the sake of the travelers, you know, that, that was the reason for it. My purpose of saying that is that it's not Jewish tradition. Jewish tradition, even to this day, is burial within 24 hours. But uh, this embalming that would take place was quite a procedure. We're told in verse 3, now 40 days were required for it, for such is the period required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him 70 days. Okay, we're told that at this time for the Egyptians, it took 40 days to do the process of embalming. It was their purpose to preserve the body because they believed the soul was going to return and they needed to keep the body as ready for occupation as could be. So when that spirit returned, it would return to a good body. So for um, over 3,000 years, the Egyptians embalmed people of preeminence for this reason. It wasn't necessarily every little, you know, every Tom, Dick, and Harry, but it was especially for those that were considered preeminent, those who were important, those who the spirit would be, you know, coming back to. But there's also, um, in historical studies, the fact that it took 70 days for, for uh, mummification, the period of mummification or of embalming. So, Knowing that both were customary, why 40, why 70? What do we do when we're dealing with the difference? I can tell you in scripture, I believe it's in scripture, I don't have the verse, so maybe it's just in history. Uh, when Pharaoh was, was, when he died in this process, they mourned for him for 72 days. And what it could be, what I do know from scripture, is for the Jewish people, for Moshe and for Aharon, when they passed, put it that way, you know what I'm saying. In Deuteronomy 34 and verse 8, we learn that they mourned 30 days, that there was a period of um, mourning during that time. The Orthodox Jew today, uh, well, they have a way of doing it today. In the past for a little bit, the Orthodox Jew would tear their clothes. Now because clothes are expensive and they're not wanting to do that, they'll pin a cloth to their clothes and tear that. But they tear it to show, um, like, that they're heart torn. You know, it's to show, it's, it's a sign of mourning. They will not party. They will not celebrate. They especially sit Shiva, which is seven days, where they mourn. They turn the pictures to the wall. They don't look in the mirrors. Nothing that can bring them any kind of joy. They sit, some of them even on hard boxes. They won't sit on comfortable furniture. Some will sit on the floor. They just go through a time of showing respect through their grieving is what they are doing. So the 70 days, what are we looking at? 
the possibility that it took 40 days to do the pure the the mummification the the embalming and then after that was completed that they had the 30 days of mourning that would make up the 70 days so it may be it doesn't matter because it's not going against scripture scripture didn't say one thing one way in history saying something else but when we look at this if you were to do it on your own i didn't want you to have any confusion well wait a minute she talked about 30 this is talking about 70. that could be our difference right there is um, that they didn't include the time that mummification process Oh, thank you. That mummification process at Chicxulub, they had special priests that worked as the embalmers, and they would treat and they'd wrap the body. It would be um, ritualistic. There were prayers that were said along the way. There were they performed different points at different stages. What I'm trying to say is it was a whole routine. It was a formula. I'll put it that way. They followed this formula. So they even needed to have a detailed um, knowledge, have detailed knowledge. How do I say that accurately? They needed to know the human body to be able to deal with what they were dealing with. So even though they were priests, they had to be very knowledgeable in scientific or in medical ways. Uh, because again, they're preserving the body to be a permanent home for the deceased soul. And this would allow him to transfer from being an earthly being to being a divine being. So that's what Egypt thought. Okay, they're going to cross the line. That's why it was like for the pharaohs and the ones that were respected. It wasn't for the everyday person. But they, they go through all of this. I can tell you in Orthodox Judaism and practice to this day that there are certain people who it is their job to take that body, to wash it um, ceremonially, to prepare it for that burial, even though that burial is going to be within 24 hours. It's done with great respect. It's done with prayers along the way. It's done with a lot of ritual also. So even though both are different, both agree in some ways. Uh, the difference is the Orthodox is not believing that they're going to help them turn into being a god. Uh, if you ask the Orthodox where did their loved one go, usually the answer is we hope it's good with him we hope he's in god eden that means the garden of eden which is their way of saying we hope he's in heaven they're hoping that that the good works have brought them to that point that god has brought them into his presence they only have a hope and that's why the mourning period is so difficult because they don't have the hope that we have as believers that's a sure hope where we know we'll see that loved one again if that loved one had put faith in Messiah and Savior Yeshua Jesus. What a difference it makes. We've gone through that with family that is not believers and through it with family who is believers. And it's night and day. We can have a rejoicing and a memorial to remember rather than a time of mourning because we know it is good with them. It is great with them. It is better with them than it is with us. We wouldn't even want to bring them back into this world once they have been released to be in the presence of the Lord. But uh, in Egypt, at this time, mummification did take place. So they were going through the rituals of that. For someone, they respect it. Because remember, Yaakov is not Egyptian, but it shows the respect they had for Yosef and for his father. Yes, Rhonda, and unmute yourself. When you said they hope that their family's in heaven, are you talking about Old Testament times or now? That's even today, Orthodox Jewish, today. But back in, the, back in the day, I thought they all knew they went into Abraham's bosom. In, in biblical time, like for Yosef with his father, yes, he knew his father was going into the heart, the, the paradise side, as it's described in the Brich Gadashah, the New Covenant. Uh, he knew where his father was going. He knew he was going to where his ancestors were because he knew that God is a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the way it said in the Brit Hadasha is he's the God of the living, not of the dead. So yes, they knew that. Judaism today has lost their basis in scripture and they've added on so much of man's thoughts and man's traditions that they don't have that security of knowing because really how can they they've lost the way of salvation in clarity 
they know they can't make sacrifices because they don't have the temple. That's the only place the sacrifice can be made. The only way to be right with God is to make those sacrifices. Since they can't, they substitute prayer and good works. That's where they're putting in what man has decided, and that's where the doubt now comes in. Have they done enough good works? Did they live a good enough life? Did they have favor with God? Is it okay with them? My dad's personal experience when he lost his uncle, who was a good man, his rabbi at that time said, you know, we do hope it's good with him. He was a good man. You know, we hope it's good with him. When his father died, who had not lived a good life, a different rabbi at that time, my dad approaches him and asks, and his answer simply was, don't stick your nose in God's business. Neither of those answers satisfied my dad. It's part of what the Lord used to tag in his heart to make him go on that search that he finally found his, his Messiah, his Savior, his peace in Yeshua, Jesus. So at biblical times, those who walked with the Lord had that faith that they knew. But as we move on through time, and as we move away from the scriptural way of salvation, there's only hope at best. And it's not the hope, when we refer to our hope of salvation, it's a sure hope. It's kind of a bad word to use today because the connotation is different, but you have to know what it meant at that time. Okay, does that make it clear? Go ahead. Yeah, so they, they became a nation in 1948. So, have they just been waiting all that time for a red heifer? Or why haven't they built the temple the, all this time? Okay, the Orthodox are the only ones that would be looking for a rebuilding of the temple, a reestablishment of the sacrifices and everything that is needed. If they're not Orthodox, which is eight out of 10 Jewish people are not, nine out of 10 aren't, aren't uh, ultra. Um, you have the majority of the people in Israel who don't know, don't care, whatever, whichever it is. They're just secular. Israel born again as a nation is a secular nation. It's, it's Ezekiel 37, 36, oh my goodness, 37. Yes, 37. It's the dead bones, they're, they're there in Israel, but the spirit is not in them. There's no life yet. We know that they will be brought into life as the Spirit of God does come back into them and into the nation as a whole through the time. We're talking about the end of the tribulation period when they finally look to their Messiah and Savior and those who go into the millennium are the believers. But the majority of Israel doesn't know or doesn't care both or either about what God says. For the Orthodox who do care, they, they struggle, there are two groups in there. One group believes that only you, the Messiah should establish the nation of Israel and have his temple. So they even fought against the 1948 establishment of Israel. They lost, thankfully, and they, they um, appreciate Israel, but they still think it's gotta be things by Messiah. So they're looking for Messiah to come and Messiah to set up the temple. Then there's a group huh. in there that's Orthodox that does want to set the temple up, get everything ready for Messiah, prepare the way. They're, among them are those called the Temple Mount Faithful. They're the ones that have made every implement that's necessary in the temple to be in accord with the laws, to worship God, to follow Him, to obey Him, everything not just the high priest trained to do sacrifices but they have everything when you read all the different um what's the word i want what they are like the the altar and the menorah and you know every piece of furniture when you read about in the tabernacle which went into the temple they have all that it's all ready it's all made it's ready to go into use they keep it in the temple treasure institute because they don't have the temple that it's not a museum where these are replicas or ideas. These are as authentic as it can possibly be and ready to be used. They'll empty out the institute and put it right into the temple. The temple can only be built on the Temple Mount. That's where it belongs. That's where God chose to have it. That's where it's to be. In 1948, when Israel came into being a nation, she did not get control of Jerusalem completely. She got control of part of Jerusalem, 
but part of it she did not. In 1967, with the Six-Day War, they gained the reunification of Jerusalem. It all became in Israel's hands. That's the first time they could go to the Western Wall. The Western Wall was the retaining wall around the Temple Mount. Temple would have been up here, Western Walls down here. It wasn't the Western Wall of the Temple. It was the Western Wall, the retaining wall around the Temple compound, I guess I could call it. So now they had the, the first chance to have the area of their temple under their control. At that time, and still true today, there are two mosques up there. The one that you see easiest is the big gold dome, the Dome of the Rock, and the other is El Aqsa. It's the silver looking dome. It's a smaller dome. Both are on that Temple Mount area. Because some of the leadership wanted it so hard to make peace with the Arab brothers when they regained Yerushalayim because Israel respects anyone's religion. They said, okay, we'll leave the Temple Mount area in where you have your mosques, we'll leave that in your control so that your people can still practice your religion. And we're doing that to show we want to make peace with you. That's what they even tried to tell the local people who were living in Jerusalem when the battle came to, to, to fruition, was the Arab leaders were telling the, the Arab people, get out of Jerusalem, we'll battle, we'll wipe out the Jews, they'll be gone, you'll come back to your home and to their homes, you'll, you'll gain all this victory. Israel said, don't leave, don't fight, Come together with us, we'll make peace. We can live side by side. Well, Israel had the battle to win because they were not safe as a people with the enemy right there in their midst. They, they, it was more than just Temple Mount they were fighting for, they were fighting for survival, as they are doing today. Make that very clear. The massacre of October 7th is why Netanyahu today cannot put the weapons down and, quote, make peace. He has no peace partner. They have no desire to make peace. Their desire is to have the peace called Israel and to wipe the Jew off of the map. So with all of that going on, Moshe Dayan especially, the name if you're familiar with that time, said, let's put a, let's hang out the olive branch of peace to our Arab brothers. We'll leave you in control on that Temple Mount area. We'll control around and below, but we'll let you have that area. That's the way it is to this day. And there are those who believe that there is room to put the temple up side by side with the mosque. Now, whether there is or not, will the Orthodox Jew feel that they can worship their God literally side by side with a Muslim who is out of the minaret that's up there that's so loud you can't hear yourself talk when it goes off five times a day? and in Arabic is inciting the Arab men to go to war, to kill the Jew, to kill their enemy, to kill the infidel, to kill the Christian. I can't see that happening. Um, possibly, possibly, only under the Antichrist when things have changed could I see something like that happening. Because they say, oh, well, we'll just build a wall and we won't be able to see each other. You're still hearing. And I can't believe that that could happen. Now, I could be wrong there. I'm not telling you fact. I'm just telling you what I think is more the heartbeat. So there are others who do believe that in some way that mosque will either be destroyed or it will be moved. With technology today, they could pick it up and they could put it down in Mecca, their most holy city. Maybe that Christ will do that to make the peace. Don't know. But whenever they have the okay, they are ready. They have the cornerstone. They've tried to lay the cornerstone several times, and every time they do, it, right in that area, war starts to break out. So the police make the Jewish people, the Temple Mount Institute faithful people, make them take their cornerstone back down. You can't lay it down. You, you can't do this in this way. It's not the time to do that. So that's the battle that's going on to this day. The only thing that they're lacking is that red heifer to have everything that they need. Because for that high priest to step into high priestly role, he has to be cleansed with the ashes from the red heifer. So he's been trained, he knows what to do, he's ready, but to step into it, he's got to go through the ceremonial cleansing. 
So they are actively looking because they want to build that temple and they want their high priest to be able to be ready to step in. So that's why you hear, and because Christians love to hear what fits in with our scripture, they get all excited when they hear about the red heifers also. I will tell you, and I'll get to your question in a second, I'm sorry. Um, they've had red heifers for a long time. They have to be between two and five years of age. They have to be watched for a time to make sure that they stay 100% pure, which means not one white hair. And every time they about get close, a white hair appears or two white hairs or something to disqualify, and they're back to the beginning and they start again with new red heifers. They get the red heifers sometimes from America. Texas is a place that does sponsor and send red heifers. So that's nothing new, but they are watching. They've got some within the two to five year range right now, but they haven't been declared, this is it. In God's time, it will be, because they will have to have it to, dip, to get the temple going, and the temple will be going before the middle point of the tribulation when the Antichrist puts his image in the temple and stops the daily sacrifices. So somewhere between, I believe, between the beginning of the tribulation and that middle point, it will be built, it will be ready, it will be in use. It could be built before the rapture. I'm not telling you which side it's on because scripture doesn't tell us which side. It could be, but I think the scenario in my little peon brain <laughs> <laughs> is more likely it's going to take the Antichrist's false peace to bring them to some sort of cohesion with that Temple Mount to be able to work the details out to have it happen. So that's why I think it's a little more likely right after there's a major change that's going to take place, which I believe because of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit takes us out of this earth, then the man of sin is revealed. And I believe at that time, that's the most likely scenario. I could give you one more little slice on it. In fact, I will real fast because I'll lose my thought and then I will get to your question. Again, hear me clearly. Where I can give you scripture and verse, I will say I declare on the basis of the word of God. So I'm not telling you this on the basis of the word of God. But we keep our ear to the ground because you read the Bible with one hand and you read your newspaper with the other and because we have an insight of things that are going on in Israel. Uh, they've looked for the Ark of the Covenant for a long time, and there are those who believe they know where the Ark of the Covenant is. I have uh, someone who I know personally more than trustworthy. He's a Bible educator. He has started everything from preschool to, to master's level. He has taught in foreign countries. He has taken many groups to Israel. He is personal friends with the head of Temple Mount Faithful Institute that I've been talking about. He has been a friend for years with the one that would be called the rabbi of the wall. That would be the rabbi who's controlled what's happening at the Western Wall. And at one time, the conversation with that rabbi at the wall, and there are those, let me say, that believe that the ark is buried underneath that area, that it's been cut off from access on purpose but they know that it's behind that cutoff point. So at one point, my personal friend asked the rabbi, I'm making a long story short, believe it or not, but he asked him if they were on the right track, you know, about that, have we indeed found the Ark of the Covenant? The rabbi said, basically what he said was, I can't answer you, but he had an ear to ear grin. So he was hinting that, yes, you're on that right track, Yes, we've got knowledge, but, you know, just leave it there, okay? Now, here's my personal scenario. The Antichrist wants to act like he's making peace with the Jew. That's the, the major role of the Antichrist. He is not in place of Messiah. He is against Messiah. He's against Christ. He's not going to... to come on in a way that they think he's the Messiah. He's going to be of Arab descent. When we get into our little bit of prophecy, I'll bring that out with scripture references if you like. Take it at face value for the moment. So if he's of Arab descent, he's wanting to say to Israel, you can trust me. I am your peace partner. I'm not a boss from Hamas. I'm not the Ayatollah from Iran. I'm not the leader of Hezbollah Sinar that they're trying to hunt down right now. And they got one other main leader the other day, thank God, because these are just terrorists who are out to kill. I'm really going to make peace with you. 
Now, if Israel, after, and, and I believe with all the confusion, all the change, all that's going on after we've been raptured, if they were to bring out that ark about them, the Antichrist could easily say, you found your ark? Good for you. Build your temple for it. In his mind, he's thinking, that's going to be mine. You're going to be my laborers. You're going to pay the money. I'm going to reap the benefit because I'll take control of it one day. I'll make it the place to worship me. But he's not going to verbally tell them that. He'll just say, hey, you got your ark? Yeah, make your temple. And that'll show you Jewish people that we are nice toward you. We want you to be able to do your religion the way you think is right. We'll get out of the way for you, and we'll let you have that. And on would go that, hey, look at what he's able to do. He's bringing Jew and Arab together. We can actually coexist, and it's going to look good. He's on with his flatteries. We're on through the tribulation. So there's just a hint of what I think could be a timeline, but I'm not here to tell you that's it. You know, this, here's scripture, here's verse. I just can tell you, yes, scripture and verse, the temple is established. The sacrifices are happening before midpoint. Okay? All right. Yeah. I heard about a year ago about where the moss is, and they didn't want the Jews up there at all. They, they, they don't. They, they did kill um, a few at that time. They wouldn't, they wouldn't leave, and they got upset over it. There's always a battle. Yeah, and and so a few Jewish people can go up at a time, but they can't even pray up there. If you're caught as a Jew praying up there, the guards up there, which are Arab, will stop you. And believe me, their eyeballs are everywhere. They are watching. This goes back to the 1990s, early, early 90s, my trip to Israel. We were up on the Temple Mount. There weren't a lot up there that day. We weren't inside. We were outside. I'm going to tell on me. I started to trip. I was jumping over a little thing, and I started to trip, and one of the men that was close by caught me and helped establish me so I didn't go down. In no time, here comes an air guard, and he says to the man, no, 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 no touchy, no touchy, because you don't touch a woman in, in public in the Arab world. That's a no-no. So that's all we did. <laughs> and boom, they were on us. And there have been others that, yes, there have been incidents, many incidents. They never have even allowed them to do it prior to That's just the consensus of the good majority of the Israelis that they should not have given control to the Arabs. And the Arabs are not controlling it to the point of safety so that you do have Israeli police around down below. We have had incidents where they got trapped and two were killed recently. Oh, I say recently, several years back. It was a big hubbub up because that shouldn't happen. And one of the skirmishes that started that was a Jew wearing his kippa on the Temple Mount was told to take it off. That hit every, every household in Israel. And you had a split over where people decided. The majority, and I agree with them, a Jew should be free to wear his kippah anywhere in Israel. That should not be against, it should, he shouldn't have gotten in trouble for it. But that's the type of, because they're dealing with all those heads that want control. Okay? I see wheels turning. <laughs> Are we good? It's just the idea that you know, they should have never, if they have known the Old Testament, they should have never even gave the land away to make a peace, because you know that's not going to work. And if they knew their scriptures, they would yeah. know their Messiah. But they're still looking for their Messiah to come first time. They're looking for him to come as ruler. They're not looking for the suffering servant at all. That's why they missed him when he came. I never so. saw so much crying in Oh, it's a very hot spot. Oh, if you're talking about that, the news makes it look big and bad, and I'm not going to tell you it's not, but they are a minority. Even though I saw the sea of people, I know what they're talking about, tens of thousands have turned out, but they are the minority in Israel that are crying against protesting outside against Netanyahu right now. They make it look like a majority, but it's thankfully it's not, but it's still, it's... it's it, it's just bad, and I just pray, Lord, silence them, silence them. Yes, Ron? Um, I'll agree with you and say that's the way it is in our country, too. Most of the people that are protesting is a small minority, but they make it look bigger. 
And Absolutely. Then going back to earlier, yes. I remember even this in the seventies when we were there, mm -hmm. we were cautioned about our behavior on the Temple Mount. Absolutely. And there were certain places where we weren't supposed to talk. Yes. Things like that. Yes. And so and and obviously if they missed him the first time, that's part of the reason they want that temple and all the worship and everything because they want to get back to that so he can come. Right, right, exactly. If I did not make that clear, thank you. Yes, they are looking for him to come and they want to ready up for him. So there needs to be the, the temple, there needs to be the sacrifices, there needs to be everything that, that so he can step in and rule from there. So yes, that is their intent. That's the, the Orthodox that are trying to adhere to the scriptures but sadly they are um, blinded to not see even this one point from 70 AD on no one can prove their Jewish genealogy that's why we don't know what tribes we're from unless we're Cohen or Levi that we know okay that's the tribe of Levi but outside of them no one can prove it you can say oh well my family says but you can't prove it on documents Messiah had to be proven to be from the house of David, David. He had to be able to show his pedigree. And no one from 70 AD on can. So how can they have to turn a blind eye to that and just say they're going to accept someone as Messiah because he's not going to be able to prove it. But we know God would never do it in that way. If God said he's going to fulfill all this prophecy, then it had to be in time for them to see and to know. So, yes, ma'am. Can I ask a question sure. about the scripture reference? Yes. I didn't want to interrupt all this in time stuff. So it was interesting. But but you want to get back to Genesis so we might finish it? <laughs> well, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Why would Joseph do a pagan mummification of his dad with pagan priests as a follower of God? It had to have been just that he knew for the trip to honor his father, he had to allow that to, the, the mummification process to take place. Did he control it to some degree and not allow them to do every step so that they weren't doing some of the ceremonial things that would have been against his God? I don't know. I can't tell you, but I've wondered that same thing. How much did it bother him? But he, he had no choice in the sense they couldn't get to the cave of Mokpla that fast, and they couldn't take a body that was corrupting. Oh, yeah, so he may have felt that they had to cave in on that. You know, to but I'm sure he controlled wherever he could. I would guess that he was in a position, obviously, to tell them only do the process. Right, and not the ceremonial he part. the body in a certain yeah. state. So I'm, I'm guessing that he probably did just tell him, you know, do yes. the process. But not the ceremony, that sort of thing, yes. Yeah. And I think he was in a position. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to see that respect was shown to both Joseph and, and Jacob. Joseph definitely was in a position being second whip. Okay, but did he actually know that the spirit was not going to come to that body? They didn't know that yet, did they? The so, Egyptians believed that, okay. but he knew that the spirit goes into Abraham's bosom and awaits the time of resurrection. That's, that's what he knew. They believed in the resurrection. They were looking toward it. The first fruits of that was Messiah raising from the dead and showing himself to, to the world at that time. It proved that life came out of death, that they only looked to it, believed in it, put their faith in it. So he did believe, Jacob believed, there's going to be a day of resurrection. I want to be in the promised land when, when that day of resurrection comes. I want When I'm resurrected, I want to be right where I should be, in Israel. Not in Egypt, in Israel. So they looked and they believed they had faith toward But they did not believe in the spirit coming back into the body. You know, they, they just believed in a resurrection. And I don't think that they even had the knowledge that we have of how the body will be changed meeting that spirit and go on forever in immortality because those verses come to us in the Brit Hadashah in the New Covenant. So we get a little more understanding than they had at that time, I believe, unless it just, you know, we don't know everything. Okay? Any other questions? Okay, I can see. 
the wheel stream. I love it. I love it. And I get to do this, you know, in a week of preparation. You all get it thrown at you. <laughs> so I'm with you. But let's go on and let's do see what happens because when the days of mourning for him were past, and Joseph would have had to allow that because they were showing respect, you know, in, in honoring those days of mourning. So when those days were past, Yosef spoke to the household of Pharaoh saying, if I've now found favor in your sight, please speak to Pharaoh saying, okay, house or household, whichever word you have, he spoke to, to remember he's living in the palace. So he spoke to those that, that would be the servants of Pharaoh, you know, going in and going out. Remember he's second in charge. He answers to no one except to Pharaoh. But instead of going directly himself, he's going through those who are going to be going into Pharaoh's presence, the servants and others that are going to be going in. And he could be doing this something for diplomatic purposes, that he was just going through the channels to try to acknowledge the Egyptian way and that that was his point in doing it. Um, maybe he, they, they could get to him faster than the protocols he'd have to go through for him to get there. But I think more likely there's another reason for it from the Jewish viewpoint. Okay, remember when he was brought before Pharaoh right out of prison, what did they do to him? They cleaned him up, they shaved him, and they presented him clean cut to the Pharaoh. That was the Egyptian way. The Jewish way, the, the men had beards. They had the long side curls. Cleaning up is fine, cleaning up is good but he would not have ever been clean shaven according to Jewish ways. In the time of mourning, you're not allowed to do any kind of perfuming yourself, cleaning yourself up. Uh, I mean, yes, you're not disgusting to the people you're around, but you know, nothing special, nothing extra, and he definitely would not have shaved during that time. That would not be. Even those that, that don't keep the orthodox ways, they're, they're like in between, they do some and not everything. Even those, uh, there are times when you've seen them, you can tell they've got seven days of growth because they didn't shave during that time where they did before. So for Yosef to go before Pharaoh, he would have had to go against those Jewish traditions. So I think it was even more that, that he knew he was not presentable. So he went through the Egyptian channels that could go in for him. Because remember, he says, if I found favor, you know, do this, honor me in this. If you're, you know, happy with me, if you're pleased with me, then I ask you, do this for me. Go to Pharaoh and let him know, I need to take my father to where he, um, to, he uh, commanded, I'll use the word, he commanded me where he was to be buried. So it could be diplomatic, but I think even more, it's, it's staying unshaved, unadorned, keeping on, you know, they, they would sit in sackcloth and ashes. We read that. You know, when they would mourn, they would not dress up and look appropriate to meet the Pharaoh. He wants to show me something. What does he want to show me? In ancient Egypt, the beard was seen as an attribute of several of the gods. Although real facial hair was not often admired, Pharaoh's divine rulers would wear false beards to signify their status as a living god. And you see them in the movies, they always have a, there's like this long, straight, thick beard, but it's always straight, almost. You know, it's really interesting. Yeah, and that's and it, movies, but yeah. yeah. That's, I wonder but this is interesting. It's, yeah. I'm unaware of that. I do know, and I'll be honest with you, I'm not, not my taste, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but Aharon's beard went down to his knees. There's oh, a scripture, I think, in Numbers that, that refers to her. It's in the Kings. I'll have to look it up. Wow. But it talks about, um, I think it was the oil that dribbled off his beard that was all the way down to his <laughs> knees. <laughs> because they never, they never cut it. They just, they did not cut it, they did not trim it. That's why you'll see many rabbis today, the ultra-Orthodox, with, with pretty good scraggly beards. And as far as the curly part, that might be just, okay, this is, this is, um, what's the word? When we say something about a, a people group, this is... Um, stereotype. Stereotype, thank you, thank you. But we Jews often have curly hair, <laughs> okay? It is the stereotype, but I have often thought that's why our men have such scraggly beards, because they've got that Jewish crawl. They can't fix it, so it's not Between them and their wives, I'll put it that way. <laughs> okay, so let's see what goes on. He, Joseph has asked for favor from Pharaoh through the, this, these means, 
And he says, tell Pharaoh this, verse 5. My father made me swear. That was the word I wanted when I said commanded. My father made me swear, saying, Behold, I am about to die in my grave, which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. There you shall bury me. He made it very specific. And we know Yaakov, Jacob, did say that to Yosef. To, that he did not want to be buried in Egypt. He wanted to be buried in the cave of Machpelah that he had with Abraham and Isaac and uh, Ra not Rachel, sorry, everybody but Rachel. Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Leah, and now he would be there. Okay, so that is what he was asking for. And notice how he says that he dug for himself. He's not the one who bought the cave of Machpelah that was originated with Avraham when he needed a place to bury Sarah, his wife. But I think very likely what they did is they made another place within that cave to bury themselves when they were, you know, like Isaac would have done it when he buried his father or his mother, you know, one of those times. And then when Isaac was buried, Jacob very likely made a place for himself in that cave at that time. It, kind of like they're doing it so that the children don't have to do that, but they're going to honor their, their parents, you know, by following through and burying them there. And then they don't want their children to go through that, so they fix it for their children. Even the tomb where most people believe Jesus was buried had a space for, I believe, four Three or four? At least three, if not four, yes. So, yeah, yes. The, a lot of times a family would do that. They yes, would very set much. Set it up ahead of time. Very much, yes. Yes, good point. Because uh, that's even later, and, and we they see the tradition. Do that today. Yes. In some mausoleums and stuff. Like that. Yes, yeah. Yeah, it, they, they, have, they even want the family plot, you know, rather than all individuals. So, yeah, yes, good points. Good points. So, Avraham's the one who bought it. Yaakov dug his own space, apparently, no problem with that. So, because it was, Yaakov made Yosef swear, he says, now therefore, I'm in the middle of verse five, please let me go up and bury my father, then I will return. Okay, he's asking for permission to go. He's even um, making it like an oath. Didn't, what did he say? There was a word in here. Um, maybe it's not here. Well, it, it comes out in verse 6 when Pharaoh says, Go and bury your father as he made you swear. He, he made Pharaoh realize, I had to make an oath. I promised my father I would do this. So he's making it very clear why he needs to go and what he's doing. But um, what, we, what we need to see is that that grave was a claim to the promised land. That was Yaakov saying, This is our land. This is where I want to be in that day of resurrection. I want to be residing, even in death, in our promised land. So even making Yosef swear to follow through was showing Yaakov's faith in what God had said, that I had given this land to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to his descendants forever. That's, that's what we're seeing here. So verse 7, so Yosef, oh, well, it's verse 6 then. So Pharaoh said, go up, bury your father as he made you swear. He gave his permission, go do exactly what he said. So does Yosef go alone? You might think that he would have, that he and maybe a few of his family members would go, but no, we're going to see a whole entourage goes. So Yosef went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt. This was your leading officials, this was your court, your state. These are the, 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 um, the hierarchy, okay? Pomp and circumstance. This would be the closest I think we can see in our day and age is England because they still have a king and a queen and look at all the ones who turn out and follow the carriage, you know, they have this procession. That gives us an idea that we can picture of something in our day and age, but it's amazing that all the leading officers from the courts, from the state, from Egypt, were going to go up, we're going to be a part of this, and that shows, um, what am I going to call it? Um, I'm looking for it to see if I put it in my notes. I'm fighting for words today, I'm sorry. More for respect of Joseph, because they didn't even know Jacob. 
Right. The 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 inner circle would have known Joseph. I, I'm sorry. Would have maybe got to know J Jacob a little bit, but they knew Joseph. They did have such respect. Remember, he rescued their country. He rescued them with his plan to get them through the famine. He showed such great wisdom. They turned everything over to him little by little till they literally owned nothing and were his slaves. They trusted him as slave owner even that he would treat them with the respect and dignity of, of human beings, and he did. So this was their chance to, to respect who he was and his traditions to respect his father. And so definitely it was an Egyptian procession that moved out of Goshen that showed respect to both Jacob and Joseph that uh, it was a funeral with all the honors, the 21 gun salute for the, the one who had been in service and uh, respected every way that they could. It really tells you the impact they had on this land at this time. It was quite something. So it, it was called a, an official state funeral. That's what I was looking for in my words earlier. So they're all going to go up. Uh, well, notice then, okay, we're told that the household, the elders all, and verse uh, 8, and all the household of Yosef and his brothers and his father's household, they left only their little ones and their flocks and their herds in the land of Goshen. So all of Jacob's family goes. All of them go. The only ones that they leave back are the little ones because the traveling would have been too hard. They needed to move. They needed to not be slowed down by babies, you know, so they didn't take their little ones, but, um, and remember, they've been there for 17 years. They were 70 when they came down. Remember, they've grown in that number during this time because they've been having babies, obviously, but leaving behind their little ones and leaving behind their flocks, that would ensure Pharaoh they were going to return. They weren't going to pull a fast one. You know, the famine's over now because the famine was only for seven years. That's long past. So they could have worried, we'll lose our great leader. He won't want to come back down. He'll stay in his homeland. No, no worries. If you left your little ones, you're coming back home. You're not intending, or I'm sorry, you're coming back to Egypt. You're not intending to, you know, pull a quickie on them. So it probably gave them security and they probably put their herds and all into the hands of Egyptians who said, you know, we'll, we'll feed them, we'll take care of them while you're gone so you can travel without being encumbered by them. So again, showing the respect, but Yosef showing his full intent was to just go bury his father and come back down and live in Egypt. But we'll pick that up in just a couple of verses, so I'll say a little more then. Verse 9, I think we're ready for it. Yes, there also went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. The chariots probably were wagons to carry the supplies because they'd need to eat on the way. They'd need, you know, everything that they need to, to prepare food because they didn't have a restaurant by the side of the road in those days. They didn't have places to check into the hotel and have all the amenities there for you, so they had to take everything they needed along with them. And the horse and horsemen was like the cavalry, and that probably would have been for protection because there would be marauders that would be out after, you know, anyone that they found away from an area where they didn't have support. Now, what's interesting is the count of the funeral, of a procession, of the embalming, everything that we've been talking about, we see that in Egyptian monuments. We see that in uh, burials of the famous, the important, the hierarchy in Egypt. We see that through their history. So the same thing they did for their pharaohs and their, uh, their high respected officials, they did the same thing. We do this for ours, we're going to send that along with you. So it was all part of what they were doing. Um, but in the oldest of tombs in Egypt, they find the pictures, the hieroglyphics showing this. So, um, so in essence, it was a mix of a Jewish and an Egyptian entourage that went and is carrying out the burial of this Jewish man. You've got, can I call it in quotes, Arab and Israeli working together to bury a loved one. Just interesting point. Okay, let's see how much, because verse 10 tells us, when they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, and that's all I can give you, 
I tried ancient maps, I tried all kinds of finding other information where a Todd was, and it could have been the name of a man rather than a city, a place, we don't know. In Hebrew it means thorns. Whatever, this place, all I can tell you, the only description, it was on the east of Jordan. It was beyond the Jordan. Actually, I can't even say east because I don't know which direction they're on, but they were beyond the Jordan. They lamented there with a very great and sorrowful lamentation, and he observed seven days mourning for his father. Here's where I think our Orthodox Jewish people of today get that seven days sitting shiva. Shiva means seven that I told you about earlier, where they dress in black, where they don't do any kind of partying, celebrating. They don't have, they don't, people don't even come visit. If the family comes to the house, they sit and they mourn in solitude. They don't, you know, there's there, there's no joy in it at all. Probably drawn out of here. For seven days, Joseph was showing this respect to his father. Um, and that was the, the custom, obviously. It wasn't that it was suddenly something he decided to do. Whether it was on this side or that side of burying the body, it doesn't tell us. Today is definitely after they've buried the body. I tend to think that. I think that they had buried the, the body in the cave of Machpelah, and as they were starting back, I think they kind of paused right there. I think Atad probably was in that area. They sat Shiva for seven days, and then they went on um, back down into Egypt. Interesting note that just popped in my mind of remembrance. When we studied um, Noah entering into the ark, he sat in the ark for seven days before it rained. This is chapter seven. I think it's chapter seven in Genesis. Look where Noah's ark is and you'll find it where God tells him to go into the ark. Actually, he says, come in. And that's from our Hebrew. You don't tell somebody to come in unless you're already in there. So God in the ark told Noah, now it's time for you to come in. This is after all the animals are in. Now Noah and his family are to come in and then he said it would be seven days before the rain would come. What's interesting is we're told that Methuselah was the last believer that, that passed away before it was now down to just Noah and his family that were believers. Hebrew tradition says he passed away the same year as the flood. If he did, Hebrew tra tradition says it's quite possible Noah sat Shiva. He mourned for the seven days for Methuselah, who had just passed away, and then it was time to go on with the program. We'll ask one day. Just an interesting thought because we studied that when we were all the way back in chapter seven that I'm sure you all remember. <laughs> wow, yes. Did, I don't know if back then or even nowadays, did they used to hire mourners? Um, or is that just that's tale? more Arab than Jewish. The, the, the Jewish joke is if they could afford to hire mourners, then they'd all have this great big mourning celebration going on, but they're too poor to do it. So uh, but it's, it's more Arab of hiring those. Sometimes you read about it in scripture where there were those who just did it. Like sometimes you read that when Yeshua raised, I think the little girl Tabitha from the dead, I think he had to put the mourners out of the house, but whether they were really hirees or whether they were people who really cared, debatable, debatable. But I can't tell you they didn't or they don't. It's just not quite as much in the Jewish traditions that I read about. Another question? No. I should have drank my water when you were asking that. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so they have mourned for the seven days. Verse 11, now when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, remember they've gone into Canaan, into Canaan. So the people that were living in Canaan, they saw this entourage. They saw all this pomp and circumstances coming and that they probably could see a coffin. I didn't bring that out clearly either, but Egyptian was coffins. They were body shaped, they were made out of wood. Um, we know the sarcophagus, the, which was stone, and after the, the time when it would just be the bones, then they would dig up that coffin that had the whole body, and they would put the bones into the sarcophagus. 
that's probably more likely what happened with Joseph, whose body is going to be in Egypt for 400 years. It probably was put into a bone box, as they were called. But for Jacob, because it's immediate, it probably was a coffin. So again, if I look in my mind's memory of England, they followed the, the, the carriage that had the body down the, down the road to where they were going to bury. It was probably like that, so the Canaanites could tell that it was a funeral. They would also probably hear them crying and you know, the mourning that was going on. But they saw it, it was so huge, um, and they saw it when they were there at the threshing floor, which means it's where um, they would bring in the wheat that they had harvested and they would separate the wheat from the shaft. That would be done at the threshing floor. So it was in that area that they said, wow, this is a grievous mourning for the Egyptians. They, the, whoever this was, the Egyptians are really mourning over him. They were, they were surprised by it. Therefore, it was named, and again, it's not on maps, but it was named Abel Misraim in, in my Hebrew. Maybe El, Abel Mis, Misraim, I don't know how you'll say it in English anyway, which is beyond the Jordan. What's interesting is that name, if you keep it in real pure form from what we have here, it means the meadow of the Egyptians, but just slightly off from that root means the mourning, M-O-U-R-N, of the Egyptians, mourning of the Egyptians. And I tend to think that was probably more accurate, and somebody just didn't, you know, when we translate from one language into another, we can make little, it's hard to tell especially like to bring something from Hebrew into English. Hebrew doesn't have vowels. You, it's, if you're fortunate enough to have a script that has markings to tell you how to pronounce, great. But if you get all the way back into the biblical scrolls, you don't even have that. It was taught how to pronounce the words because you wouldn't know whether you put an A and E, I and O, or U in there. So easily I can see how for, in the Egyptian, it could have easily been that they meant to name it the morning and it became called the meadow because that's where the threshing floor was. Anyway, it is on beyond the Jordan and I am told in my notes here and I've just forgotten that does mean east of the Jordan. So that's all I can tell you. East of the Jordan is the area they were in and they even made um, a name for the, the area out of this funeral procession. So it must have been quite something and quite unusual. I don't think there would be any other time you would see Egyptians going through a funeral procession to bury in the Promised Land, in, in Canaanite territory. You would have seen it down in Egypt. So it would have been a sight to see and why it would be marked in history outside of the scriptures. So verse, wow, my time is going, I can't believe this. Um, verse 12, right? 12, yes. Thus his sons did for him as he had charged them. So Joseph and his brothers were obedient to Jacob and did what he had asked them to do. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan, buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, where, which Avraham had bought along with the field for a burial site from Ephron the Hittite. Okay, if you don't remember all of that, um, that's, I thought I wrote down the chapter number, that we studied it when we were there. I can't believe I didn't write it down. I'm probably going to come across it in a minute. Um, but what's interesting is what comes after this. So everything's been done as we've explained, but then verse 14 is key. It says, after he buried his father, Yosef returned to Egypt. Okay, now people who, who don't think things through are quick to say, the fool, why did he go back down to Egypt? He's now in his land. He's free. He should have just stayed. No. He even showed that was never his intent because he left his little ones down in Egypt. But he knew that God had said they were to go down to Egypt and it would be when God says you're to return that they would return. And if they knew, and there's no reason to believe that they would not know, the words given to Abraham, the grandfather of Yosef, in chapter 15, verses 13 through 16, they were told they'd be in Egypt for a long time. They were told they'd be there for 400 years. They haven't been there 400 years. They've been there barely over 40. Not even 40. 17 with Joseph, 
and he was 17 to 30, so yeah, not even 40 years yet. But if they knew what God had said to Abraham and every reason to believe they had, they knew they were going to be in Egypt for a long time. Whatever, Joseph was not going to take it in his own hands, take his own agenda and say, you know what, I like it better here, I'm going to stay here. No, they went back down. He returned just as he promised. So he buried his father, verse 14, returned to Egypt, he and his brothers, and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. Every single one who left Egypt and went to the land of Canaan went back down into Egypt. They kept their word, every single one intact. Verse 15, when Yosef's brothers saw that their father was dead, well, obviously they know that, but you know now that, that all this has been done, they're going to deal with life again. Hmm, they said, what if Yosef bears a grudge against us? What if he pays us back fully? I closed my Bible. Sorry. What if he pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? Okay. What if he's carried a grudge this whole time and he's just marking time till dad's not around? And then he's going to say, okay, now I can get even because dad's not here. That tells more about the way they were thinking. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That was not Yosef. It was not. They gave no indication. He gave no reason for them to see that, to say that. But does that kind of sound like a guilty conscience? Yes, it does. You know, totally. they hadn't given that totally over to God. They had repented. We know that when they finally, when Yosef finally revealed himself to them, but they're still carrying the guilt. So yes, very much this was what was on them. They were afraid of him bearing a grudge because they deserved him to carry a grudge. They deserved him to get equal. And if you have requites us, if you have that in old King James, that does mean pay back in full, you know, that, that this is what Yosef would do. So they've got to come up with an answer. They're shaking in their boots instead of trusting. And so in verse 16, they said, so they sent a message to Yosef saying, your father charged before he died saying, your father gave a commandment. He declared, he said this. What did he say? Verse 17, thus you shall say to Joseph, oh, please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. They're admitting they did wrong, but they're saying, our father told us to let you know that he's charging you to forgive us. Yeah, right, really? If Jacob had felt that way, why didn't he tell Joseph directly? He certainly had no trouble telling Joseph, this is where you're going to bury me. And that was in his last breaths that he was giving him those directions. So he easily could have said at that time, and by the way, don't do anything against your brothers when I'm gone. Even though they deserve it, don't do it. He could have easily said that. No, that was not in his mind. They dreamt up that if we say that dad said it, then maybe we'll get his good graces. So they're concocting a way to keep themselves out of trouble that they know that they deserve. First, did I read all 17? No, I didn't. Let me finish that. Um, and now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. So what they're saying in that, forgive our trespass, our, our transgression. Forgive what we did. We're admitting that we did wrong. They're really even admitting what a man sows, he reaps. We know, we sowed, we deserve to reap. But they're, and I lost my train of thought, oh, but they're saying, behold, we are your servants, okay? They're willing to be his servants. They try to make him a servant, they sold him as a slave. They are gonna reap what they sowed in that sense, and they're going to say, we'll be your servants will be under you. So they're, they're willing to submit to that point. You know what that does? Anybody remember Yosef's dream? You'll serve me. You'll bow down to me. They're bringing his dream to pass again. They're saying, we are your servants. We're bowing down to you. So again, what God said is what is happening. They are reaping what they sowed, but in a way they didn't intend. But notice how Yosef responds to this. Was he grappling with his own conscience about wanting to get even? We never read that, and we don't see that in his actions. When they said that to him, when they brought this plot, oh, Dad said, his response was that he wept when they spoke to him. 
I think it broke his heart that they were of that frame of mind, that he had shown to them true forgiveness, and that they would think that he'd bring that back up that was just an act covering up till, till their dad had passed away. And he says to them, do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? Should I judge you? That's basically what he's saying. He was so genuine in his forgiveness and his compassion that he was saying, I have, who am I that I should even judge you? Not even that should be with me. I'm not in God's place. That would be for God to, to uh, carry out if God wanted to do that. So when he spoke to them that tenderly, that lovingly, showed them that compassion, even though dad is buried now, then verse 18, the brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. Again, full fulfillment of that dream that God had given Yosef many years ago. They sold him into slavery. Now they're willing to be his slaves and bow down as his dream had shown. So very interesting how it comes about in that full circle but not in the way that they were they were thinking. Um, where am I left off? 20. Uh, yes, thank you, verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me. He, he, he admits it. He's not saying, oh, you didn't know what you were doing. He says, no, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. What a verse. You intended, but, and I love the but in there. And the, the present result, as in that day, he said, this is why God did it. God did it because as it puts here, he wanted to preserve many people alive. Yosef had to be in that place in Egypt to preserve their lives. So what you meant for evil, God had meant it for good. That's what we see. If we would think about that in our circumstances, when we're wanting to lash out and say, why am I in slavery? Why am I in the pit? Why are the circumstances against me? Why can I not see the hand of God? Why is he not doing it the way I think he should? How many of us, if we would just hold on and keep our mouths shut and our ears open to the Lord and our eyes to see what he shows, will we see that those very things that we thought were bad for us, end up being our blessings, end up being for good for us, that God's working a full and a complete picture. And he said almost exactly those same words five chapters earlier when he first revealed himself to his brothers. He right. literally told them almost the same thing. Right. Don't worry, you know, you meant for bad, God Got meant it for I good. Mean, he, yeah, you already told them that. Yes, which here's is great to bring more. out. Yes, it would have been because Jacob lived down there about 17 years. So it would have been years before, but how good for you to bring that out because it shows you he wasn't putting on an act and he didn't change. He was who he said he was. He was a servant of the Lord and he was honoring the Lord. It's the Lord who is to deal with judgment and to you know, meet out whatever. It wasn't for him. The heart intent that he showed when he re revealed himself to his brothers was true. And here he's doing the exact same thing this day. He hadn't changed. He hadn't put on a show for 17 years. He hadn't done it to appease his father. It truly was his heart. And his heart was right before God. And, uh, and again, you know, we're so quick to jump and judge our circumstances. And we need to remember that. It took years to see it. You may have to take years to see. You may not know until you get home to heaven. But I guarantee you everything that happens in your life, when you see it from God's perspective, you will see how it was all to work together for good. There was a, a minister that um, his, his, where he shined best was talking with people who were distressed, who were discouraged, who were, you know, just at their wits end. And he would always, when he'd bring them into his office, he would always hand them a bookmark. And he'd hand it to them upside down. A bookmark was handmade, and upside down you'd see knots and twists of the, the strings and all of that. And he'd say to them, can you make sense out of that? What, what's that picture? Can you make sense out of that? And of course, looking at it, they can't make a bit of sense out of it. It's just it's all, you know, a mess. But then he would turn it over, 
and what had been done on the other side in two colors, the background to make the letters stand out, said, God is love. You think it's all mess, you think it's broken, you think it's twisted, you think it's ugly, but God is love. And if you remember that, everything that comes to him to you is through his hand of love, his mercy, his grace. What a different perspective. I think a number of times we need to turn our circumstances upside down. We need to look at the view from heaven because God's looking at that. It's the tapestry, the weaver, you know, that, that we don't understand why there's these dark threads and we don't understand why there's knots and all of this, but he's weaving a beautiful picture of our lives that we are his craftsmanship is Ephesians 2 10 says so God brought him to Egypt ahead to preserve the lives of the whole Jewish race it was to keep many alive to preserve them and it brings to life Tehillim Psalm 76 10 which says the wrath of mankind shall praise you it was the brother's wrath that sold him into slavery and that turns out to being praise God for sending Joseph because here he is now in a position to save the entire Jewish race. Remember, well, before I say that, let me say that this is Romans 8, 28 in action. This is seeing that God works all things together for good to those who love him and are the called according to his purpose. Yosef couldn't quote that verse. Shaul Paul hadn't even written it for us yet or written it for them yet and us today. But it's that in action. Now with that in mind, let me bring to you, just looking over the synopsis, and I know you know it, but just thinking it through. If this turns out to be a large family, if they didn't come down to Egypt to live, they would have perished in the famine. If the family had barely survived up in their land, they would have assimilated into the Canaanite tribes that were around them because that's what they were starting to do. And God said, I'm bringing them down to Egypt to separate you. I'm going to keep you separate from the Egyptians even so that you won't assimilate. You'll keep your identity. You'll keep your worship with the one true living God and you will flourish and you will grow. But all of that would not have happened if Joseph had not gone down to Egypt. They would not have grown into a distinct nation as they were already growing into and we know how much they do by the time they come out 400 years later. So if we take it back, if Joseph's brothers had never sold him to the Midianites, then Joseph wouldn't have gone to Egypt. And if he never went to Egypt, he never would have been sold to Potiphar. If he'd never been sold to Potiphar, Potiphar's wife wouldn't have falsely accused him of rape. If that didn't happen, he wouldn't have been thrown into the dungeon, into the prison. And if he had never gone into the prison, then he would never have met the baker and the butler. And if he had met the baker and the butler, then he wouldn't have interpreted their dreams. If he didn't interpret their dreams, then he never would have interpreted Pharaoh's dream. And if he'd never interpreted Pharaoh's dream, he wouldn't have become prime minister, second in charge in Egypt only to Pharaoh. And if he hadn't become that prime minister, he would never have had wisely prepared to bring the people through the terrible famine. And if Joseph's family back in Canaan died in that famine, then there would not have been a family line for Messiah to come through, as was promised. And if the Messiah didn't come, that means Jesus never came. And if he never came, then, hello, we are all dead in our sins and without hope in this world. Hallelujah for the brothers selling Joseph into slavery. What a change. All that. Wow. And I say behind that, what a mastermind, what a master plan. Could we orchestrate that for our lives? <laughs> I, for one, no, I can't. But I'm thankful that I have the same orchestrator working in my life. And why, again, I say, let me zip my lips when I want to complain because it may be part of a bigger picture for the greatest glory to God that I want my life to be. That's our God. So, verse 21, therefore, do not be afraid. He's telling his, his brothers, don't be afraid. I'm not going to judge you now. I'm not in God's place. 
And as Ron brought out, my heart's still soft and tender toward you. I'm telling you the same thing I told you when you first came down. It's not just because of dad. So I'm going to provide for you and for your little ones. I'm going to see it, to it that you're going to flourish, that you're going to be nourished. And it says in our, in our English, so he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. The idea in the Hebrew is he spoke to their hearts. And I think that really is a, a better way. Words fall short, but we just, he wanted to express to them, no worry, no concern. I have a genuine love for you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of your families. Everything is set in motion and it was good. So with Yosef having completed the major role that God has put him in his life for, he stays on in Egypt as God had said. Um, he was probably around 57 when, Yo when Yaakov died because he was 40 about when he came to the throne. Okay, and um, when Jacob came, when if he was about 40 when Jacob came down into Egypt because he's on the throne, and Jacob lived in Egypt 17 years, then he's, Joseph's about 57 when his father died, okay? He's going to die himself about 53, 54 years later. He lives to 110. So he's about, about mid, midway in his life, is, is what I'm trying to say. Time is going to, to pass. And we're going to see, just an overview real quick, what happened in all those years, because what's critically important is what we've just come through. That's the major lesson of his life, how he is a picture of Messiah and was used as a redeemer for the nation, so to speak. But he is blessed. He stays in Egypt. He and his father's household, so that's he and his brothers, they stay down in Egypt. Joseph lived 110. I just told you that. This verse 22. Verse 23, he saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons, also the sons of Mechur, the son of Manasseh, were born on Yosef's knees. So he saw down to the third generation, he saw his great-great-grandsons is what we're being told. The great-great-grandsons through Ephraim, the grandsons through Manashe. So he had great-great-grandsons and he had great-grandsons. So he saw the first generation, the second generation, and he even got to see the third generation. He was blessed. And in verse 24, Yosef said to his brothers, I'm about to die. Sound familiar? He's doing just what Yaakov did. In his last days when he knew it, I'm about to die. But God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised an oath to Abraham, to Yitzhak, and to Yaakov, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. So what he is declaring is the same faith we saw in Jacob who said, take my bones back to the land because when the resurrection happens, I want to be in the land. I want my physical body in the land uh, at that time when it, it's resurrected from the dead. And Yosef is saying, he used me to take care of you, but it doesn't end there. God will surely continue to take care of you. And he's made an oath to grandfather, to dad, well, I guess it's to great grandfather, grandfather, and to dad. He promised, he made an oath. He promised by oath to them. What he's promised to them, he will make good. So Yosef, fourth down from Abraham, is showing he had the same faith that we see in Abraham and Yitzhak. We saw it in Jacob saying, Send my, take my bones back, and Yosef is declaring the same thing. It's being passed down through the godly line, and it's a total faith in the oath that God gave. That oath is a solemn pledge, and the same way that God promised the land, Yosef is saying, promise me that my bones will go back. Because let me finish it and then I'll get whatever hand I just saw that I ignored. Sorry. That's okay. okay, thank you, Loretta. Um, okay, well, I'll pick you up in a moment. Then Yosef made the sons of Israel swear. Okay, God promised. He made an oath to, to our forefathers, our, our patriarchs. Now Yosef made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall surely carry my bones up from here. Yo Yosef's putting his same faith in the word of God. Look with me in Hebrews 11, our chapter of faith in verse 22. Hebrews 11 and verse 22. Hebrews 11 
and verse 22, where we read, By faith Moshe, Moses, when he was born, I'm reading verse 23. Sorry, folks, eyeballs are going. By faith Yosef, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. Remember, he was, he was told, or through Abraham, they, they were told they'd be down in Egypt 400 years. Yosef has only been there, what, 110 minus 17. Okay, he's been there almost 100 years, but there's 300 more years to go. He's, he's believing God. It's not time, I wasn't supposed to go back in my lifetime, but I know you are going to go back. You're going to take my bones with me, with you. Sorry, with you. He can't do it himself, okay? So he's showing his faith the same way Abraham showed faith, Isaac showed faith, Jacob showed faith, Joseph shows faith. I know what God said he will do. Was he right? Was he right to put that kind of faith in God? Had God made that oath? Yes, we know God had made that oath. We read it. We started it in chapter 12 of uh, Genesis. We read it in 26 and 28, given to the sons, Isaac and Jacob. Here's your fulfillment, Shemot, Exodus 13 and verse 19. In 16 and verse 19, Moshe took the bones of Yosef with him. That's Moses, by the way. He took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones from here with you. Did Moses have a direct quote of what Yosef said? Absolutely. It was written. The same way we read it in Genesis today, they had it written down. It was being recorded for them, and they knew. And by the time you get down 400 years, it, it was known. For 400 years, they had, well, not 400, but 300 plus years, they had kept those bones. I'm sure as the ones that were in charge of keeping the bones, as they would pass that down to the next generation to take care of, they told them the charge. This goes up to Israel when God returns us to our land. You don't let these bones get lost. You don't bury these bones here. You wait, and they're going to be carried out of Egypt. They're going to be returned to Israel. And it was on Moses' watch that the bones are carried out of Egypt and it'll be on Joshua's, Yahshua's watch when they'll be buried in the promised land because Yahshua is the one that brings them into the promised land. But here they're taking their bones up. We've got it in Shemot, in Exodus 13 and verse 19. Go with me to Yahshua, Joshua chapter 24. Was uh, uh, Moses, uh, was he born after Joseph or before mm -hmm. me? After. <clears throat> Many hundred years later. Yes, yes. Joshua 24 and verse 32, we read, Now they buried the bones of Yosef, which the sons of Israel brought up from Egypt at Shechem in the, in the piece of ground which Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for 100 pieces of money, and they became the inheritance of Joseph's sons. So in that verse, we get the whole thing. The bones... Uh, Rereading it and stopping, pausing as, as I read it. They buried the, the bones of Joseph. Israel brought them up from Egypt. They buried them in Shechem in the piece of ground that Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamor. I think that was chapter 34, if I remember right, right around there. Um, Jacob paid 100 shekels for it, 100 pieces of money. I would call it shekels today. And it became an inheritance of Joseph's sons. When the land was divided under Yahshua, Ephraim and Manasseh are in the area of Shechem. That's why it would became the there those those tribes got their dad's land that he bought. It's just right. It's just right and it's complete. So jo Joseph wasn't buried in the cave of Machpelah down in Hebron. He's buried up in Shechem, which is higher up, more towards the north. Okay, we'll go back. I was just wondering, you know, why didn't Joseph? great-grandkids uh, watched the bones. Somebody did all along until it was time, you know, the generation after generation. Nobody was alive 400 years, so they passed the duty down. But well, can you imagine now if... Your bones. <laughs> and seeing to it that nothing happened, nobody let down, nobody, oops, you know, nobody, whose are these, what are these, you know, so the, the, they, they kept charge of them. <laughs> 
they did, did what they're supposed to. Bones, huh? <laughs> well, it would be in the box. Yeah. Oh, wow. It wouldn't be bones that they were looking at, but they knew, you know, what what was in the bone box, as they called it. So, um, we are ready for verse 26. I hate to do it, but here we are. Yeah, I read all 25. I want to make sure. Okay, verse 26. So Yosef died at the age of 110 years, and he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. And that's why, again, when you hear, well, wait a minute, how could he be buried? How could he be placed in a coffin in Egypt and his bones get to the land? Well, again, that coffin would, would have been made usually out of sycamore wood. It usually resembled the shape of the human body, and it would have been... Um, then, even though they embalmed, there still would have been the time that they either took that coffin and put it in a large sarcophagus, which is usually made out of stone and is a final burial, or if it, it, it either could have been done in that way, or if being mummified, I don't think the, the body would have ever um, corrupted, decayed, decayed. Decay. So I think it must have been. Rather than a small box, it must have been the large sarcophagus. Either God kept the wood preserved and they were able to take it up and then they buried the wood in the other because you find burial usually in that, the stone. Whichever way, it's not a contradiction. The, he was buried in something that was able to be carried with them up into Israel. Very doubtful it would have been stone until it was in Israel. If they buried him in stone, that would have been when. But again, it was a box that was passed down. Okay, and I have a reason for saying this. That coffin that would have been before them, that was a testimony from their forefathers and the prophecy of Jacob. That's all they would have had for the next 400 years. Or, or until the 400 years had been fulfilled. Let me say it that way, okay? The coffin, the testimony from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the prophecy that Jacob gave, and, and of course, Joseph confirming by saying, here's my bones, take them up with me, because there's no personal manifestation of God after the last time God personally manifested himself to Jacob at Beersheba. We don't read... And that was when he was on his way into Egypt. Remember when he stopped and we think that he must have been saying, you know, God, you gave us this land. Am I right to go down to Egypt? He wanted to go down and see his son, of course, but is this right for us to move down there? And God confirmed to him, you go down into Egypt, I'll bring you up out of Egypt. So from that point, when God revealed himself in a form to Yaakov, to Jacob, we don't read about God showing himself to anyone until Moses at the burning bush. That's the next time we read about God manifesting himself. So it would have been a number of years of silence. We know that there's silence between our testaments. Even though it's one continual story, we know it was about a 400 year period of silence between the last of the prophets and Yeshua coming onto the scene. And is that not interesting because we have 400 years of silence here and God brings forth deliverance through Moses. And then we have 400 years of silence in the test, between the Testaments and God brings his deliverer, Yeshua Jesus. Is it possible that God just took a vacation those 400 years? God doesn't go on vacation. <laughs> and did he speak in individual hearts? Of course he did. But what we're reading and what we're singing as a whole and a manifestation, I know, and a manifestation that could be declared, we see, we see that it was, you know, 400 years in the Moses, the 400 years in the Yeshua. Why does that ring such a bell in my mind? We just happen to be on the parasha, the portion of scripture that we're reading right now as Jewish people around the world, what we're reading this week has in it, Stavarim Deuteronomy, it has in it chapter 18 and verse 15. And that verse says, there will be a prophet like Moses. When he comes, hear him. And our Jewish people who stay and try to be into their, well, they want to be obedient to the scriptures. Let me put it that way. They study the rabbis, but if they would study their scriptures, they know we're to be looking for a prophet like Moses. 
the, in essence, the like is there's going to be a prophet greater than Moses. And I thought Moses was really great. And he was. He was a <clears throat> wonderful leader. He brought them through the Red Sea. He took care of them 40 years in the wilderness in spite of complaints, in spite of unfaithfulness, etc., etc. He even stood in a gap and prayed for God not to wipe the people out when he thought God was going to because they deserved it. Moses is greatly, greatly revered. And they'll say from Moses to uh, uh, Rabbi Moses Maimonides that there's been nobody as great as Moses. That's 13th century because they bypass the prophet that was like Moses. If they really studied Moses, they would have seen in Yeshua that he was the greater than Moses in a number of different ways. I have a whole message on that. I can bring that out to you sometime or I'm going to be teaching it in another area. I'll put it up in our archives for us if it's not already there. But the prophet like Moses. I think this silence here and the silence there where it goes from 400 years to Moses and from 400 years to Yeshua at the same time our Jewish people are studying and saying we're supposed to be looking for a prophet like Moses but greater than Moses. He's the one we're supposed to be listening to. And what is his name? Yeshua, Jesus. Out of that silence, look what God spoke. Is that not amazing? So Yosef died looking forward to God's unfolding plan of redemption. He knew there's going to be a resurrection. We're going to be redeemed. He looked forward to it. And that's where the book of Genesis, the book of Bereshit, the book of beginnings ends. <laughs> it concludes looking forward to the continuation of God's eternal plan, his loving plan, his wise plan, his amazing plan. So really, we end at the beginning. We're just at the beginning. And God is going to unfold his plan, an eternal plan of redemption. And really, I thought we were going to do this so fast, I was going to take you from that in Genesis and take you through his plan of his eternal plan of redemption for mankind and how he relates it through Israel, through the nation of Israel. So if you want, I'll still do that next week. If you're not interested, if that's just me, I don't have to do it. <laughs> I love the, the, the study. It's a, it's a great study, and I can probably do it better just as starting it next week and doing the whole class would probably take that time. That would poise us well to see God's plan of the ages because he has a plan all the way through, and it includes Israel. He never deviates. He never forgets Israel. He never wipes it off the map. He never says, I'm replacing you. So I can take you from this beginning, this end of the beginning, and I can take you through that, showing you the importance of Israel because God spoke and used and worked through Israel. So if you like that, and I'm getting an affirmative, yep. I'm getting affirmatives up there too. Okay, then that's where we'll pick up next week. I think that's good timing. We'll look at God's overall plan, which will also help us divide what happens in Scripture is all Scripture is for us, but not all Scripture is to us. We need to know our audience. We need to know who God's speaking to. If he's speaking to Israel, Israel needs to heed those words. Where if he's speaking to the what we call church, the body believers, the call that assembly, we need to heed those verses. So when we keep those separate, Israel and the church, their scriptures, then we don't get confused as to what lays out in God's plan in his timing. And we'll be able to see that very clearly. That's the perfect backdrop to take us into the bit of prophecy that we'll be doing along the way to give us the backdrop to go into the book of Daniel, Daniel, which is a hugely prophetic book that I'm so excited to get into. I can hardly wait. But we'll get prophecy now. We'll get it along. When we get into the second half of Daniel, we'll be into it heavily. So if the Lord be not come, how's that layout sound? Good? Good. Amen. Go okay. for it. Yes. Can I bring up a tiny little detail? Absolutely. I want to interrupt you when you were <laughs> yeah, near on the end of, when you were on the last two verses. Uh -huh. So you talked about um, if that small number of them would have stayed in Canaan, they probably would have been assimilated. He kept them separate by moving them to Egypt. 
-hmm. When he moved them to Egypt, because they were shepherds and all the other mm -hmm. stuff, the Egyptians kept them didn't separate. like them, and right. that kept them separate down there. Right, and we did clearly, that might have been before you started joining us, because we did clearly bring that out at the time, that they were abhorrent to the Egyptians, and God did that on purpose because that would keep them from assimilating. There wasn't going to be intermarriage. They weren't going to be wanting the Israeli women, and they weren't going to be um, the sons. You know, there would be no exchange. You said it well. <laughs> yeah, it would have been too easy for them to be assimilated when there was only seven deals. Right, right, absolutely. But God had to keep them separate. He had to keep them unto himself. He had to grow them in their belief in the one true and living God, which we see was clearly in Jacob, was clearly in Joseph, was clearly passed down. They knew to, to finally cry out to God when he raised up Moshe. And if they know their own scriptures, they would have known Yeshua is that greater than, than Moses. I think it's about eight points that I bring out, the, the, um, what Moses did and how Yeshua did it greater. Moses did it, Yeshua did it greater. Moses did it, Yeshua did it greater. It is so obvious he's the one that the scripture was talking about that if they, it, but see, they won't read the Baruch HaDashah. They won't read what Yeshua did, so they are unaware. But when we're trying to share with our Jewish brethren, this is what we'll share. Let's look at, let's see, because especially if somebody had to come before 70 AD, when our records were destroyed, then we've got to look prior to 70 AD, who could possibly be the Messiah? Let's look and see if there's anybody in history that fits that. And of course, we'll stop off and say, let's look at Yeshua. You know, now let's look at him from the historical view. Let's look at him from the biblical view. We've got far more biblical than history, but we know it, no one doubts that he lived, that he died on a cross. The doubt comes in that they don't want to believe that he resurrected, and that's where the great separation comes. But we go through it and we show them how he fulfills over 300 prophecies that were given for him in our scriptures. That is the backdrop to the four, the, the books that tell us about Yeshua's life. If you all realize how Jewish those stories are, oh my goodness. And then when you go on, because he is the Messiah, you go on and you see the rest of our, our what's called the New Testament for you all, the Brach it shows you fulfillment of what was told in the original also. It shows you even the, the um, foundation that, that Shaul Paul sets down is a Jewish foundation fulfilled in Yeshua and brings us our marching orders and takes us all the way through. And then we come into the last, which is the book of Revelation, which is the revealing of Yeshua HaMashiach. And you look at the timeline in it where God gives it very clearly of a past, a present, and a future. And it fits ideally into what God said in regard to Israel. We know where Israel fits in. We know where we fit in. It takes you all the way to the eternity future, seeing it as the one great story, his story, and how it is so orderly laid out from beginning to end. And if we can get our Jewish people to listen all the way through and see the Jewishness in what's commonly called the Christian side, and I hate that expression, but if we could get them to listen, they would hear how Jewish it is and how it's a continuation of their story and how it's here's um, it's revealed here, concealed. Here it's concealed, here it's revealed. Here it's foretold, here it's fulfilled. All the way through. Doesn't miss a point. If I had nothing else but prophecy to prove me the Word of God, that's enough for me. That's enough for me. Not one prophecy misses. Not when? That's what a John a John Khan spent doing. Oh man. According to the uh, fifty years of the two day all the days of the scriptures, the king fits in what happened. It's just I never knew such history. I just so spelled out. It, it's amazing. God is told to tell the people, you know, so And his timing, God's timing is just right oh. on target. Yes, when is. he said they'd come out of Egypt four hundred years later, they didn't come out of Egypt three hundred years later, and they didn't come out of Egypt five hundred years later. They came out four hundred years later. And all the way through Yeshua's coming. They could have as as Doctor Adrian Rogers used to say, great I'll say it, Baptist minister, I I say that just because people who have issues. It doesn't matter to me, he was a believer in the Lord. But he said, if they knew their own scriptures, 
They would have lined the hotels for him when he came into Jerusalem. They would have been there knowing this is what was happening, and they would have been able to go through the whole week knowing this was fulfillment of their own scriptures, but they didn't know their scriptures, and they didn't look for him to lose his life. They looked for this one that was going to rule and reign and break Rome's rule over them. And so sadly, they missed him. But again, who else can fit this criteria that lived before 70 AD? Not a single soul. No one. Got to start with their very beginning. They had been born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem couldn't have been born anywhere else. So for our ultra, ultra Orthodox today that want to say that Schneerson, the revered rabbi who they expected to be Messiah, and even thought he'd raised from the dead when he did die. He was born in New York. I think we have a problem. <laughs> the last I knew, Bethlehem was in Israel. <laughs> Brooklyn was in the United States. Right there, disqualified, but, right there. But they moved to the house. They built him a house, put it in Israel so that when he comes back from the dead, he'll feel comfortable living in Israel. <laughs> but, but it's all uh, by design. Yeah. It's all by design. By design, absolutely. Mastermind there, there's design. There's a time where they will realize. Yes. They will, they will, they will finally, yes. Yeah. yeah. Just like they finally cried out with Moses, you know, in that time when they were, they finally were looking to the Lord. They finally were saying, hey, we've got to get right with our God. And we'll they'll finally do that again. And that's when we'll see the great crescendo. Yes? Okay, before we, we move on, um, the Bible never says, it says Pharaoh died and a new one come in. And mm -hmm. so what happened to Joseph? Did they throw him out and he became a slave? We know that Pharaoh died at 110. So he, I don't think, lost his position. I think he died in position of second in control. I don't think he ever lost, but as it moved down, there were several new pharaohs that came up, and the one that, that finally comes up that we deal with in Egypt was, I mean, I'm sorry, in uh, Moses' day. This one was from a different dynasty and did not recognize and appreciate what this pharaoh did. So this was a pharaoh that didn't appreciate Joseph, didn't know what he had done for the country, and that's where the blessing was gone. And now you're too many, you might be our enemy, we're going to subdue you, we're going to control you, and, and life got even worse from that point on. So, uh, Because his, uh, Joseph's kids went over here, so did they just go to this family over here, and that's where they got their training about God and stuff like that? I think it was passed down through the family continually, the same way Jacob, Jacob passed it to Joseph. Joseph passed it to his children. His children passed it to their children and it continued on down. So you had a godly line that continually, God always keeps a remnant. Yeah. And but, so, but what I'm saying is, he wasn't in the position anymore because now he's a slave. So did he take his kids and moved off to the, like the... Um, he never became a slave. The Pharaoh that didn't know him comes up 300 years later. Hmm. So I think when Joseph died, his whole family was still reaping the blessings and I think they did for a long time still after that until a new dynasty came in. The closest way I can say it to you and it falls very short but we have Republican and Democrat here. When, uh, when it changes, okay, right now I'll, I'll use it by fact. We have a Democratic president. If it changes to a Republican president, there's going to be changes that are in line with what the Republican wants rather than what the Democrat wants. In that way, only to a greater degree, the leadership that came up in Egypt was so different from this leadership that they didn't recognize or accept any reason why we need to be nice to these people. We look at these people totally different. Maybe the way back when, they were good for us, but now they're just playing too many and we're playing with fire and we could get in trouble. So at this time, they put them into slavery long after Joseph had passed away. I'm sure Ephraim and Manasseh had passed away. Yeah. You know, we come down to Moses' time. And from Joseph to going down into Egypt um, to Moses is 400 years. So if Joseph only lived 110 and we take off the years that he was not in the land, we have him at about 100 years. We gotta get 
to 400 years. So there's hundreds of years. So it's like us trying to study back in our own history in America, we don't even have 400 years of history. But do I really know who supported George Washington and say we should respect that family and that unit? And no, we don't even know. So it, it got lost. Does that help? Yeah, well, I was just thinking about the kids because to start out with, there was no God, right? Except the father, he kept the... The father was the one responsible to, to teach spiritually. Yes. Yes, and I believe that continued God always kept a remnant. So in even in Moses' day, we see that because we had the, the midwives who feared the God of Israel and wouldn't take the lives of the boy babies. We see the mother that knew there's something different about this son. God's got his hand on this son, and she hides him, and it's Moses, you know, and, and God was at work so that he got raised up in the Egyptian court, so he was the one that could know how to deal with the Egyptian court. But even in that, we see there was a faith there. We see that there was a remnant that believed and that was looking for a deliverer to come. But they didn't cry out as a whole, as a nation, and look for that until they got miserable. As long as things were good, they were content. So somehow or another, they knew that they belonged to uh, this tribe over here, and they came with them so that they could right, proceed and, and uh, be part of, of I believe the tribes kept teaching their children, you're of the tribe of. So I believe that the children, even as they came out of Egypt, knew their tribes because when Joshua takes them into the land and they start dividing the land, they divided it by tribe. Yeah. So the tribes kept their identity and they kept the spiritual influence. There was leadership that continued it down. Some of the tribes were less, like we see, Dan goes off into idolatry first and then others follow as we get way down the line, but that's all the way down in, yeah. you know, long past, past David even. So, uh, but yes, initially even during that 400 years, they kept their tribal identities, they kept the spiritual, they taught it to their children. Even when God's bringing them out in the Exodus, he teaches them, teach it to your children, pass it down to your children, don't let it die because he's raising up a new generation. And even that generation that dies off in the wilderness the children know, you know, this is what God promised. All of them, they're going to die in the wilderness, but we're going to go into the land of promise. So it was passed down. It was continually passed down. Because they, they always kept really good records of all that stuff. Yes. So they were doing that, I'm sure, in Egypt. Yes. And then I think when that new dynasty came, everybody would have known these were separate people. Right. They're not Egyptian. Right. So, very clearly, they so were they not. So they would have said, why are we even, I mean, they would have been looked at as, like, immigrants? And they were outsiders. not only immigrants, they were so many in number that yeah. the, the new dynasty did mm -hmm. fear. If we're attacked, will they side with us? Will they side with the enemy? If they side with the enemy, there's so many that are a threat to us. They could wipe us out, and they would take over the land of Egypt, and we Egyptians would be gone. But yet, they never assimilated. They always stayed separate from the Egyptians. It's just the pharaoh that knew them when they were 70 saw that they helped Egypt. Because look at how Joseph helped Egypt, that they built for Egypt. They didn't do anything against Egypt. And that continued on in the pharaohs that followed for a while knew that and trusted them. But then when this whole different regime comes in and says, you've got two and a half million people here and you want to trust that they're going to do what you need, that they've got your best interest at heart, no, not on my watch. You know, I don't trust that at all and I'm going to subdue them. And, and just a quick point, if, if they changed regimes, it would be almost like right now here in our country, you have a real polarization with two sides against each other when you have a change like that. Right, right. And like I said, our Democrat Republic falls short because we're still a democratic nation. We're still going to have, you know, the same rights, so to speak. We may see, you know, changes within them, but we're still... We're supposed to have certain <laughs> We're supposed to. But, but it's not, you know, that, that, that we lose everything in our identity. You know, that's why I say it was even a greater change. Some need to go, 
I see it's for, we never closed in prayer. Lord, thank you. Bless us to our memory. Help us to hold on to what you want and better us in our walk with you through it. Thank you for your faithfulness, for seeing your hand, your master mind and your master design. We praise you. You just are awesome and amazing in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.